I am honored to conclude today among this distinguished group of women whose research and dedication inspires me. And I thank you sincerely for sharing your insights with us. It is slightly daunting to be asked to contribute my words to a discussion that has been going on for so long and has so many strong voices already within it. But I hope that in describing some of my experiences, I may in particular strike a chord with those of you who are entering an artful life and that you may find my offerings useful. I would like to give some backstory on what underscores my commitment to an intersectional feminism that advocates gender, racial, and economic justice and equality, and the ways these values emerge in my creative practice. But I must also admit that I have wrestled with whether or not to include certain parts of my biography in this lecture. I have determined to do so as although it may be uncomfortable, it is relevant and perhaps vital to the theme of combating erasure. It is a challenge for me to speak holistically of my identities as, among other things, an artist, a woman, a worker, and a survivor. These difficulty, this difficulty arises from a conditioned pressure to omit parts of who I am to suit various situations when it has been made clear that there are facts about my existence that are inappropriate, burdensome, or otherwise impermissible. I endeavor to change that dissonance for myself and others and believe that solidarity can be forged through shared struggle. I know that some of you will relate to what I'm going to say and hopefully in general this talk will highlight some issues that persist as long as they are cloaked in stigma or, other, or otherwise considered out of place within broader cultural discourse. There is a real danger in assigning credibility to only one frame of reference, which is that very quickly the margins become full of non-conforming individuals. White heteronormative male artists have historically been positioned as the objective voice of human experience within European and European-influenced art, an outlook that mirrors the primary power brokers and patrons of recorded so-called Western culture. However, this is simply one point of view among many, many others. It is valid, but not singular. The dominance of this perspective is often both subtly and overtly linked to ideas of universal value, something many young artists are taught to strive for without learning of the problematic biases that operate alongside this concept. If one reason for the existence of art is to describe society to itself, to reflect that human condition of searching for meaning, to interpret the unknown and unknowable, then there is an unavoidable political dimension to the questions of who gets to make art and who is it made for. I've asked myself some version of these two questions over and over again as I've proceeded in the world. In the face of a classical and historical canon that often shows little trace of life as I know it, that does not speak to the meaning that I seek, I've asked, do I get to make art? And for whom do I make it? Is there a place for my subjectivity or am I only a deviation from what is worthy and correct? I didn't grow up thinking that I could be an artist. This wasn't because I didn't know what art was. There were people in my family who exposed me to a diverse range of music, literature, and visual traditions from an early age and living in the San Francisco Bay Area meant access to an active multicultural cityscape. The feeling of losing myself in a song or a story or a picture was thrilling, and it made my imagination itch with possibilities. I was a rather anxious and lonely child, but in that solitude, I built a theater in my mind where anything could happen, from the ecstatic and adventurous to the strange and mysterious. The act of creative discovery fused to my sense of self in a way that has been indivisible ever since, and I can guess that this merging of creativity and identity is familiar to many of you out there. But it was also impressed on me that while these passions were fine as hobbies, my first obligation was to find a way to support myself. It seemed only certain people were allowed to pursue art full time, and I could be sure that I was not one of them. At the age of nine, I started babysitting the smaller kids on my block, and by 14, had my first tax-paying job at a swimming pool. In between these milestones, a traumatic sexual assault led to my being placed in a Catholic school where fewer people knew of what had happened, a move which I think was meant to reduce the fallout of this devastating and unresolved crime. 
However, the silence I felt expected to keep around my violation quickly grew into a fearful shame so intense that I hedge against speaking about the incident to this day. I mainly do so now because to leave it out as though it did not affect me deeply would be false and would capitulate to that shame I refuse to carry any longer. I attempted to move on and think practically because it seemed that was the only available option. And my love for art was not practical, even if to me it was essential. There was concern that I would further impair my future by pursuing a field in which it was notoriously difficult to make a living. I interpreted this to mean that I lacked not only the funds, but the wit and perseverance to even dream of getting ahead. As I was told a college degree was required to obtain a steady job with benefits, I thought that studying journalism might be my best chance at reining in my interest to more realistic confines. I took out a stack of loans, moved to New York, and practical thinking lasted about a year before I caved in and signed up for every poetry and painting course I could take. As before, I worked all kinds of jobs, mostly in food service. I was too nervous to dabble in some of the other ways a number of young women I knew were making quick and impressive money in sex work. I'm not sure if this sounds shocking, but it should be no surprise to anyone that women's bodies are regularly used to generate capital, both for themselves and others. I completed a lot of assignments scribbling in the corner of some nightclub coat room, reading in between waiting on tables, trying to balance my desire for intellectual development with the more pressing need for food and rent money. When the hardship is involuntary, the cliche of the starving artist is not romantic, but extremely stressful. When I graduated, I decided it was time to get that good job I was supposedly now eligible for and ceremoniously quit the last restaurant I vowed ever to work at. After a rocky month of unemployment, I finally saw an advertisement to hand out the audio guides in a major museum. After three months of doing this, someone pointed me in the direction of becoming a security guard, and, when, and within a year, I was working in museum education, a field I had never heard of until then. This was the first step towards supporting myself in the arts, and thus closing the gap between my so-called hobbies and my livelihood. I actually got paid to stand in the galleries and have conversations all day. And over seven years, I spent thousands of hours listening and talking, looking at people, looking at art, observing the crowds, seeing who came in, how they reacted, what pushed them out, and what brought them back. And I can never underestimate what an effect that environment was to have on my thinking as a maker myself. To watch the technical and philosophical cycles of a large cultural institution from the inside out was revelatory. One of the most interesting things I discovered was that it was possible to learn something from absolutely everything I saw, and the search for what I liked was soon outpaced by an insatiable curiosity about the infinite story of images. Then when I began working in accessibility programming, People with blindness and low vision taught me a whole new language of seeing that revolutionized the way I considered objects in space. It was an unusual and profound kind of schooling all its own. At around 20 years old, I had decided to start telling people I was an artist. I moved in artsy circles and with artsy people and eventually began showing my work wherever I could. I also learned the art system was not entirely the meritocracy I had assumed it was. I genuinely hoped that I just had really bad luck, but casual misogyny, racism, classism, and homophobia were not hard to come by throughout the multiple spheres in which I found myself. I faced hurdles and threats directly related to the perception of my social status as weak and powerless, notwithstanding the ways I simultaneously benefited from the toxic systems that privilege white cisgender citizens. From being the recipient of endless unsolicited and condescending advice to backhanded compliments like my work didn't even look like a woman made it, which hasn't changed. <laughs> Walking that double fine line between asserting myself to be taken seriously and being labeled a difficult bitch to having a collector make it clear they were only buying my work so they could possess something of me. There were so many offenses and transgressions to my boundaries, it would be absurd to remember them all. 
To round out this appalling list, a romantic relationship with another artist became a decade-long nightmare of jealousy, addiction, and domestic violence I was only able to finally escape by leaving the country. Again, a condition of shame and fear spelled a dangerous silence for me. Having recently learned that he is trying to publish a novel wherein he distorts and excuses those years of abuse that almost cost my life, I must point out that this is nothing less than an attempt to literally make a profit on the presumption that I have no voice or visibility. As the great Zora Neale Hurston put it, if you are silent about your pain, they will kill you and say you enjoyed it. So this is yet another reason why I have to speak up right now. At times, it has felt there was no choice but to create a barrier between what the truth was and what I needed to pretend in order to continue. This cognitive split was a survival tactic, a disavowal of my own knowledge that preserved me in certain ways while destroying me in others. The toll this denial of self takes on a mind, on a spirit, on a body can't be calculated. Every single day, it is robbing the world of people, people who have dreams, people who are loved, people who are fighting just to live fully as themselves in the face of relentless negation. When I hear about Lucrezia and Artemisia, and even though we are separated by hundreds of years, I feel their stories on a visceral level. The World Health Organization estimates that one in three women worldwide have experienced physical and or sexual violence in her lifetime. That means chances are it has touched the lives of everyone here, whether they know it or not. That means it is a crisis so pervasive, we've hardly figured out how to talk about it, let alone solve it. There is a dense history where I live near the marble mountains of Carrara. My family and I often go exploring, and recently we made our way up to a group of ancient petroglyphs that represented some kind of solar clock, inscribed in symbols that were both functional and invested by their purpose with beauty. I imagine what life was like when these carvings were made, and how it compares to the way we live today. How much is done out of survival instinct, and how much in the name of these other feelings we can't quite put a finger on. And the question I really ponder, which echoes both then and now, is how do you endow your existence with meaning when so much of your time is spent trying to stay alive? What kind of art does a person make from all this? In contemporary practice, there is room for everything. The rules and methods that have applied in the past have always adapted to shifting times, and there is no sign of that changing. Artists impel a rotating scenery, and right now a new stage is being built by and for those who wish to see themselves in dynamic complexity, who wish to share their sharp and splendid truths. We cannot be satisfied with incomplete and exclusive practices. The stakes attached to someone, the stakes attached to ignoring someone are high and have always been high. Finally, I want to refer to the image behind me. This is a piece I made while on a fellowship in France, or rather, this is me performing a piece I made, which in the other iteration has plaster arms and does not move. For this project, I had proposed to undertake a study of tomb effigies, the full-size statues of people placed above their coffins, many examples of which could be found in a basilica outside Paris. The translation of death into sleep or of life into stone, related to work I had done experimenting with layers of detachment through various media, a fascination I think is closely linked in my case to an impulse for mutation and disguise. After a few weeks of solitary thinking, I decided to make an effigy of myself. The idea was to extract the parts I desperately wanted to be rid of, suffering, flashbacks, humiliation, trauma, and place them outside as if it were an exorcism, or more accurately, a garbage dump. I thought by symbolically externalizing them, I could enact a kind of cleansing and relieve myself of these troubles for good. They got in my way, they held me back, they kept me from feeling what I thought normal should feel like. But the more I contemplated what I wanted to get rid of, the more I began to notice how through this action I was actually accepting responsibility for a series of situations that had been beyond my control. 
There was something apologetic in it, as though I was agreeing that I was not fine as a whole person, that the totality of my experiences had to be sanitized. And for whose benefit? Certainly no one who cares for me or what I have to say would ask me to do such a thing. And that's when I realized, in fact, it was the self-censure and blame that needed to go. So my effigy became a nameless stand-in body who could be anyone whose presence had been shrouded but not eclipsed. It would not be overlooked, even while concealed, a thing you could not refuse to see, hidden in plain sight. Maybe a ghost, maybe a deity, or possibly something in between, in between, signifying not death, but graceful transformation. Through my art, I ask how to exist. I have as much a right as anyone to this question, so yes, I get to make art, and so does everyone else. When I exhibited this piece, a person came up to me with tears and said when I saw that body on the floor, it was me. In some way then, I made it for them. And I make it for anyone who needs a space to be present and think about their existence too. Sometimes endurance is the most exquisite expression we can summon. Some days I feel like being alive and well is the best work I could ever hope to achieve. Getting to a place of safety is one thing, but healing is not a quick or easy process. The fits and starts, the pendulum swing between primal panic and steady control is evident in some of my work out in the gallery. Through my work, I record my, her story, weaving in crystals that are at once too lethal and too precious to speak of. But today I've tried to shine a few of them for you. I am constantly amazed and invigorated by the people and environment I now surround myself with. Cultivating a community of friends, peers, colleagues, mentors, and family is necessary for life and art. Necessary. <laughs> you can't do this alone. <laughs> there are more initiatives than ever before to tangibly realize this urgent work of expanding cultural inclusivity, understanding that empathy and compassion do not, imp do not impede but enhance a richly textured map of art, that there is profound value in the public voice, that everyone must be welcome at the table, and if it doesn't seem like there is room for everyone, it must be remade. I'm finding my place and look forward to seeing you all there. Any questions? <laughs> just want to thank you for uh, your words today. Um, I'm deeply pleased that you were able to uh, come to where you are now. I'm doing the same work for the same reasons, only way, way down the road from you. And I think it's just marvelous, and thank you. Thank you. conference symposium it has been because um, there have been so many different voices from so many different pers perspectives and studies and I think it has been wonderful and enlightening for us all and Elizabeth has suggested we should make this an annual event so perhaps we should. 